Welcome back for another fine lunch meeting in the rain at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, president of the Institute. It's my pleasure to see so many friends and colleagues here today in person, as well as we hope hundreds of millions of people uh, watching on the webcast or on demand at a later time. Netflix has nothing on us. Um, more seriously, it's a great pleasure to be leading off the opening for our semi-annual Global Economic Prospects session. As many of you know, under the leadership of David Stockton, we twice a year roll out our forecasts for the major economies, starting with Dave's uniquely insightful analysis of the US and then drawing on the resources of the combined team here at the Peterson Institute. Uh, everybody, as with everything here, is independently responsible for their individual views, um, but everybody here gets comments on their individual views, and we hope comes out the better for it. Um, we will head into the session that's a little bit different than usual in a moment, but I'd just like to make two quick uh, further announcements. The first is we're also released this morning online uh, a new policy brief by our colleague Olivier Blanchard, who is, of course, the C. Fred Bergston Senior Fellow here at the Peterson Institute. Um, Olivier has his own assessment of the state of the advanced economies, and like ours, is coming out a little before the World Economic Outlook of the IMF that he used to run. Um, and I think it is not in any way deeply different from where I and my colleagues will be coming out, but it is a different perspective and raises different issues, and I would commend all of you to read this as well. The second thing is I would just note, while I have those hundreds of millions of audience out there in virtual land, that we are coming up next week not only on the WIO, the World Economic Outlook, and our own version today, but the annual meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, which is always a very busy time here at the Peterson Institute. And I just wanted to flag for people that we will be having our second annual joint conference on China's reform and financial future with our friends from the CF40, the China Finance Forum 40, next Wednesday, most of the day here at Peterson, and almost all of that will be broadcast live as well. We're very proud to be hosting both U.S. Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu and European Commission Vice President Valdis Dombrovskis on Thursday morning, October 6th. Uh, come for one, you get to see both, uh, but they each will be speaking on their respective briefs, and we're grateful to the Vice President and the Treasury Secretary for joining us. We also will be continuing a new initiative to try to draw attention to the issues in Latin America, which of course is not a focus of today's World Economic Outlook presentation. Um, we believe the major economies are potentially at a turning point, and we will be hosting Federico Sturzenegger, the new president of the Central Bank of Argentina, on Thursday, October 6th, to discuss that. That dovetails nicely with our presentation earlier this week by Arminio Fraga, the former governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, and our esteemed board member, Robert Zellick, in which we discuss the future for Brazil and Latin America. We will also be having a panel of our own in-house experts, Chad Bound, Monica Debola, and Jose De Gregorio, on aspects of the Latin American future. And then on Friday, October 7th, Pablo Garcia Silva, the next day, from the Central Bank of Chile board, will also be discussing the broad picture in Latin America. This is a not too subtle signal that the next American president, whoever she or he may be, should look not only beyond walls metaphorically, but should look a little south geographically that there are some other things going on in the world worthy of their attention. Finally, I would like to flag one other potentially very interesting event. Again, we'll be webcast live. Lars Hendrik Roller, who is the German G20 Sherpa, Chancellor Merkel's chief economist, and someone I've known for a long time, a very great economist, will be presenting the German economic policy approach on the afternoon of Friday, October 7th here. 
and we will have discussions by Olivier Blanchard and our non-resident senior fellow, Patrick Honahan, the former governor of the Central Bank of the Republic of Ireland. So we have a very exciting program coming up, and we hope you will join us one way or the other for all of it. Let me now just briefly say one thing about today's session. As you know, this is our semi-annual session. We do not pretend to have a global, huge forecasting model and team. What we pretend to do is have unique and one hopes occasionally useful insights. Um, but we have done something, David, Dave Stockton's leadership of this process, we've done something a little different this time. We are emphasizing a little more the political risks. Not so much making political calls, that's not our business, but recognizing the reality that the election coming up here in this country as well as in Europe and the potential political changes in China as well in the coming year will have an effect, although again, first and foremost, of course, is the question of the response and the policies of foreign countries to the U.S. economic outlook. And so we've gathered, in addition to Dave Stockton, three other people to speak today on related topics. Uh, I will be lurching into the area of fiscal risks and looking at potential outcomes that are not in the modal forecast, both for the US and for the world. My colleague, uh, Rory McFarquhar, who, excuse, yes, Rory McFarquhar, who is a visiting fellow with us, uh, we're delighted, has been a visiting fellow with us for the last several months, will be presenting on potential US-China economic relations and how that is going to affect the economic outlook going forward. Rory was, of course, a special assistant to the president and ran the U.S.-China economic relationship discussions for the NEC in the Obama White House until early this year. Um, has a distinguished career at the NEC and at the Treasury and before that in investment banking. And we are delighted that Rory is with us. Thank you for contributing to today's event. And then finally, a perennial audience favorite, my dear colleague Jacob Kierkegaard, who has been associated with the Institute since 2002 and is known as uh, the man who knows Draghi and Merkel better than they know themselves. Um, Jacob is analytically grounded in a political economy view of the European Union's processes and decisions that I think has proven very rewarding for people to follow. And he's going to be taking us through not only Brexit, but more the aftermath politically and in political economy terms for what will be the policy mix in Europe as well. So we have a very rich discussion. We will, of course, have on the record questions and answers following the presentations. Let me now call on David Stockton. David has been with us for the last four years um, as a senior fellow. He's also chief economist at L.H. Meyer um, and was, of course, for 11 years, the chief economist of the Federal Reserve Board. David. Thank you, Adam. Um, as you can see, I'm characterizing the global economy as something akin to a driverless car that's stuck in the slow lane. Everybody feels like they're getting taken for a ride, but they're pretty nervous that they can't see anybody actually in control and wondering well, who actually is driving this car. And they're frustrated because they're stuck in the slow lane and they don't see anybody, that obviously, that they can complain to and no easy controls to get out of it. So I think um, we've got basically a story of, for the global economy, it's still a 3% economy. I don't really see much at the currently suggesting that we're going to break to the upside, and I don't see any significant signs that we're likely to slump to the downside either. One of the big events since our last presentation was Brexit. Uh, here, we think Brexit is more likely to be a structural than a cyclical event. That is, I'm expecting there will be some dent in the UK economy next year, given uncertainties. But I think they're going to avoid recession and something that really would be a cumulative contraction in output. Over the longer term, Brexit will, I think, depress incomes and depress potential output for the UK economy. But that's going to take some time to develop. It. 
For Europe, I guess we're still expecting things to continue to run at about 1.5%. Uh, that's a bit of a downgrade from where we were earlier when we were expecting some acceleration closer to 2%. Uh, Europe has not been immune from Brexit either, but again, it's a relatively modest uh, effect. Um, for Japan, there simply isn't in the incoming data any sense that momentum is building to the upside. I do think the most recently announced fiscal stimulus package will show through to a modest step up in GDP growth, uh, but I think in Japan, the Bank of Japan's challenge will be to sustain inflation above 1%, much less test their recently announced commitment to getting it above 2%. In China, um, I think you know basically the story that Nick Lardy has been telling about China, which is that we are seeing maybe some slowdown in GDP growth, but that really is symptomatic of a rebalancing and not the front edge of a more serious hard landing for the Chinese economy looks to have been very well supported by recent developments. And while there's still obviously some, some pretty substantial risks there, the most likely outcome is still for just a very modest slowdown in the Chinese economy. Uh, for Brazil and Russia, re recessions appear to be ending, but uh, those positive figures that I've penciled in for 2017 should not be characterized as an actual recovery. It's just basically economies that have, have had a very hard landing now moving mostly sideways. And the bright spot in the emerging market area continues to be India, and we are expecting a consumption-driven uh, expansion to continue there. So much like for the global economy, where it's still a 3% economy, for the U.S. economy, it still looks like a 2% economy to me as well. I'm expecting growth to continue to bump along and somewhere in the vicinity of 2%. Given how we have had to progressively lower our sights for what constitutes solid growth of the U.S. economy, 2% actually is an above-trend pace of activity. That 2% forecast should be sufficient to result in some continued erosion of the margin of slack in the United States and some decline in the unemployment rate. That tightening of labor and product markets is expected to continue to put a little bit of upward pressure on inflation, which uh, I have getting back to the Fed's 2% objective at the end of 2018. So again, it's pretty much more of the same for now. Um, a reasonable question to ask is how to make this forecast, so what the heck are you assuming about the outcome for the elections in the United States? So I have a hard enough time doing economic forecasting, so I'm outsourcing, I'm outsourcing my political forecasting to a, a few reasonably well-respected uh, prediction sites. Uh, PredictWise base, uses betting markets. Uh, Princeton Election Consortium is a metadata analysis uh, approach, uh, 538, and the New York Times upshots are combinations of polling and statistical models. What I take from this is the most likely outcome for the election is that we have a Democratic president, Hillary Clinton, and we still have the Republicans holding at least one of the houses uh, in Congress. So it's going to be divided government, more of the same. My forecast is a modal forecast. I should mention that, because it's not a weighted average of a variety of outcomes. I'm just simply looking at the most likely outcome. I see the most likely outcome is continued gridlock uh, and not much action on any of the big programs that either candidate is currently advocating. I do think we'll have a modest shift in the policy mix. Uh, over the course of the next year or so. In this forecast, I built in a $60 billion uh, spending package. The mo logic behind this is pretty much the same as a year ago when the budget, uh, b budget negotiations led to an $80 billion lifting of spending caps. I think we're still going to need to have some lubricant to reach agreement, and I think that is going to come in the form of both uh, a, a spending package that consists of both some increase in infrastructure spending and some increase in defense spending. This is all small potatoes. This is not a big fiscal stimulus program. This is, again, just uh, a little bit of a lubricant in the budget process. Uh, in terms of uh, what this implies for my forecast, just to make it clear how small this is, this is about a tenth on GDP growth in 2017 and 2018, with a little bit more in 2019. Uh, going on. Um, on the other side, in terms of this ch shifting policy mix, uh, 
Uh, my forecast incorporates a, a gradual uptrend in the federal funds rate, uh, putting too fine a point on it. It's expecting an increase in uh, the funds rate in December, two more increases next year, and three the following year. That's pretty close to what the Fed is currently anticipating. Um, as you know, for those of you who have come to this meeting uh, over the last several years, uh, I've been continually arguing that the Fed was too optimistic in its assessment of how quickly they would be raising rates. Um, I, they have moved down uh, um, considerably, uh, and I now think it's a realistic forecast that the Fed could actually do what they're saying. That's a different thing I should note from what I would recommend. Uh, that's, this, is not, this is my forecast of the Fed, not my forecast of what the Fed should actually do. Um, and you should notice, even though the lines look a little bit steep on the right-hand side, uh, this forecast only gets uh, the funds rate a little bit above 1.5% by the end of the forecast period. So this is still a very modest uptake. Um, in terms of the details of the forecast, um, I guess the thing I would want to draw attention to is that over the last couple of years, we've actually had pretty solid increases in private domestic demands. We've been running in excess of 2.5% there. And that has been offset by the drag that we've gotten from the strengthening of the dollar in terms of net exports and the, the external sector of the U.S. economy leaving us close to this 1% pace. So there's been, some people have argued, geez, that all this um, monetary stimulus really hasn't shown through at all. I think it has shown through to an improvement in domestic demands. Uh, but we've been facing some headwinds and will continue to do so. Um, obviously, the, I think the inventory adjustment that has sort of been weighing on activity over the past year is now largely behind us. Uh, in terms of the pieces of the forecast, um, on the household side, you know, we, we, this expansion is now pretty lengthy. And I think we're starting to see some signs, I would say, uh, and consumer durables, that the pent-up demand that had been driving spending over the last few years may be largely played out by this point in time. I'm expecting motor vehicle sales to basically, U.S. motor vehicle sales to move sideways. Um, in part from the uh, release of the pent-up demand, in part because I do think it will be more challenging financial conditions going forward for the for consumer durables and motor vehicles in particular, uh, so that, that that is going to weigh on activity there. By contrast, housing has continued to sort of steadily slow, but steadily improve. And there, I think we have yet to begin to sort of reach uh, having fulfilled pent-up demand. There's still, we've been running well below in terms of housing starts, what would normally have been considered enough to satisfy growth of the population, trends in second homes, demolitions. So I think we still there have pent-up demand left to go. <laughs> On capital spending, um, I'm only looking for modest increases in uh, business fixed investment at this point. The big drag that we've had on investment spending over the past few years coming from the collapse of oil prices and the associated reduction in drilling and mining activity, as well as the machinery that goes into that industry, is now likely coming to an end. So a big negative will be go to something like a small positive, so we get an acceleration in overall investment spending, but not really much strength. And in part, the reason is this still is an economy that is not straining its productive capacity. And one measure of that, an imperfect one, and the industrial capacity utilization measure produced by the Federal Reserve is just symptomatic of broader um, other measures of capacity and anecdotal reports. It just doesn't feel like an economy yet. So that the impetus to get a faster step up in the pace of uh, equipment spending just isn't there currently. Um, the bright spot for the U.S. economy remains the labor market. Uh, and we've been continuing to produce jobs this year in the range of 150 to 200,000. As you can see by that uh, blue line, the pace of uh, payroll employment growth has slowed somewhat over the course of that year. So. But what I'd really like to draw your attention to is the shaded area of 80 to 100,000 on this chart. That is roughly speaking what is needed to meet the growth uh, the trend growth in the labor force. So we've still been generating job growth well in excess of what would be expected uh, to be needed to sort of off to meet the uh, growth of the labor force. 
Despite that, the unemployment rate over the past year has been flat, not down, as you might have expected from just looking at the left-hand side of this chart. Now, this is uh, a development that Janet Yellen has pointed to last week at her press conference and uh, yesterday at her appearance before Congress as an encouraging sign uh, that the labor market, in fact, has been able to generate jobs without putting significant downward pressure on the unemployment rate. And of course, the main reason for that has been there has been some plateauing uh, in the downward trend in labor force participation. Uh, for those of you that have attended this session over in recent years or some of the special uh, events that we've held on looking at uh, the U.S. labor market, you know, one of the big question marks has been, you know, how much of the uh, downward trend in labor force participation was complete structural and how much was cyclical, with some folks arguing that it was all all structural, and others arguing there was considerable considerable amount of a cyclical. So I think this red line is not a model. It's just a line drawn through a chart. Draw your eye to the fact that, in fact, we have gotten off that downward trend recently. I don't think that is likely to persist that long. And in fact, I would expect by late next year, middle of next year to late next year, to see a downward trend driven by dem demographics resume. But I think the important point is, for those of us who thought running a little hotter economy could, in fact, produce the side benefit of drawing people into the labor force, there is some evidence that that, in fact, that benefit has occurred. And we're still not sure how much more of that would, left, would be left to, to play out here. Um, almost all other measures of labor market performance have improved and improved significantly. But as you can see, part-time um, part employment for economic reasons, people who would like to be working full time but can't because the, their employer doesn't have the is not providing the hours, has improved, but it still remains somewhat elevated. So this still feels like a labor market that does have some room to grow that we have not exhausted. One of the ways in which you could at least check that hypothesis is looking at labor compensation itself. The single best measure we have in the United States for labor compensation is the employment cost index for private industry workers. And really, thus far, it's not shown any clear upward movement yet. Um, so that doesn't appear that the decline in the unemployment rate or the tightening up that we've had has produced any, any significant acceleration. Other measures show a little bit more reason to think that maybe we are beginning to hit some of those uh, uh, constraints in the labor market. The average hourly earnings, which is covers uh, just wages, not wages and benefits, uh, has shown a little bit of an upward trend more recently. And then a measure developed by the Atlanta Fed, which looks at median wage change uh, taken from the uh, current population survey, the household survey, uh, has shown a more pronounced increase. I look at this and the anecdotal reports uh, that are available as suggesting I think we probably are beginning to see the front edge of actually uh, some modest acceleration in wage growth, and indeed, I'm forecasting a, a modest increase as well. Um, just like we've had to lower our sights on what constitutes solid GDP growth, I think we also, given the weakness in productivity, also need to be lowering our sights on what constitutes good wage gains. I, we're not going back uh, in, the, in this current environment to 35 to 4% wage gains. I think we should be setting our sights that 3% is about what we're going to be able to get for the time being. Um, on the inflation side, obviously, uh, energy, food prices have been really holding back headline inflation. Measures of underlying inflation, whether the core PCE index or the Dallas trim mean, which throws out outliers on both upside and downside in terms of price change, have shown a small increase from where they were, just a small increase. And I think as well there, um, some of that recent jump, the, the red line, the core PCE, probably is the end of some transitory factors. The strengthening of the dollar, the big drop in energy prices that had indirect effects that were lowering overall inflation, that's probably passing through. Going forward, the acceleration that I am forecasting is just basically moving up what is a very shallow Phillips curve at this point. So in the context of continuing declines in unemployment rate, continuing tightening, a product markets, I'm expecting a very modest increase in overall price inflation. To finish up with um, 
coming back to the slow lane story. So um, these are a decomposition of productivity growth in the business sector into various components. Total factor productivity, which you can typically think of as technology organization. In fact, it's just a residual in the calculation, but it, it is intended to pick up the parts of productivity growth that can't be explained by increases in capital. Capital deepening, the fact that uh, workers over time get more capital uh, per worker to work with. And then labor quality, which is each hour worked is enhanced to the extent that there are improvements in experience and education that are boosting things. At the, right before the financial crisis struck, I think you know, the profession was uh, uncertain about how much of the step up that had occurred in the mid 1990s to mid 2000s was going to be a permanent new economy and how much wasn't. But it was still the case that a lot of people were looking at the 73 to 95 period as the outlier. Why did productivity grow slow? Why was it so slow in that period? Well, if you now look at the next, um, uh, the next 12 years, it's start starting to look an awful lot like, on average, where we were in 73 to 1995. And as you can see, between 2004 and 2007, before the financial crisis got started, um, it really, that, that bar looks remarkably like 1973 uh, to 1995. We had a, a jump in productivity as, uh, in the, during the initial phases of the deep recession as employers were really slashing employment a great deal. They were also getting rid of low-skilled, le less experienced workers. Uh, of course, more recently, um, We've had extremely slow productivity growth. Um, John Fernald, who developed these data, produced six different models to uh, forecast what it would be going forward. And that I bar sort of gives the range of forecasts from his six different models. The red dot is just where I, I think the most likely we're going to be here uh, going forward at roughly one and a quarter percent uh, uh, productivity, half a percentage point for growth in, in hours in the labor force, uh, we're kind of looking at potential GDP that's running around one and three quarters percent. Um, so what about the takeaways? I'll finish up here. Uh, so right now, my advice would be just embrace the boredom. Sit, ha have a nice cup of coffee, relax. This is, this is what we're going to have for a little while. Um, it's not so bad. It's not great, but uh, it's a lot better than exciting circumstances that we've all lived through more recently. Um, as Adam and Jacob will talk a little bit about as well, uh, one could even, I think, identify upside risks to the global economy that might be associated with a shift to a more uh, uh, significant fiscal stimulus in a variety of different countries. So that, and that feels to me like the first time when I can actually, when it, feels real, like I've felt like so many times in the last few years when people ask me about the upside risk that I had to kind of make up something uh, just to have an upside risk. This actually feels like maybe a, a real one. Having said that, um, <laughs> I think the risks are still skewed to the downside. And I don't mean by that that the distribution of potential shocks to the global economy is more heavily weighted to the negative side than the plus side. What I mean by that is, whoops, uh, is that if we in fact get a shock, at this point on the downside, it's going to be extremely difficult for macro policies to respond quickly enough and forcefully enough to offset that shock. And one really doesn't want to be in a situation where you were thinking about any significant part of the global economy being in, in recession at this point. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, it's my turn to be the uh, little shot of espresso to be a bit of an antidote to boredom. Um, we'll see how far that goes. Uh, as Dave mentioned, what I'm going to focus on is what I'm calling a non-modal view. Uh, obviously, one can always come up with tail risks coming out of any election. I think it has become a uh, sort of trite point to say that the tail risks in this election are rather large. Uh, 
and they are certainly skewed in one direction. Uh, what I have tried to do in the spirit of what Dave and with some influence from my colleague Jacob and others is think through a little more specifically and spell out more explicitly some assumptions on how you would end up with a fiscal upside risk because I, I genuinely think it's, it's a real issue. It's not a fat tail. It's a genuine part of the distribution. So if you think about the election, in the left column I have what's basically the modal forecast like David. I don't pretend to be a political forecaster. I take from the, the best to average other people and someday this will all be pulled out of air. But anyway, the modal forecast remains that Clinton is elected president, that the Senate gets a small Democratic majority, something 54, 53 seats roughly, and that the House retains a Republican minority and is slightly diminished. And in that scenario, assuming the kind of dislike House Republicans have for Secretary Clinton and for government spending, you get a continued budget deadlock. We just saw this this past week with another threat of a government shutdown, even though they didn't really mean it. And as a result, we get the kind of continuing resolutions that we've been seeing. Budget policy, fiscal policy in the US stays close to neutral, which then gets you to a Fed that says, OK, there's no shock coming from fiscal policy. It's just those labor issues and inflation issues that Dave was talking about, maybe a little bit about the dollar. And they stay on their gradual hiking path. So this is what gets you, if you're as smart as Dave, Dave's forecast. Now, why might that not happen? Why shouldn't we assume that that's what's going to happen? Well, the key question is, firstly, what kind of coattails do the presidential candidates have? Uh, I think everyone here is familiar with that expression, but it's the idea that whoever wins the election brings with them additional votes in the, for their party and their candidates in Senate and congressional races. And there's actually a pretty decent political science consensus on this in the US, including a paper that was just featured in Vox relatively recently, that you get the longest coattails or the strongest coattails when the presidential election is uncertain because then people are more likely to turn out and people are more likely to vote their preference. If it's very certain that somebody's going to win, even if it's your own party, you're much more likely to engage in European-style strategic voting. You're going to say, well, I don't want this person to have too much power. I'll vote the other way. I'll counterbalance them. Or I'll let other factors affect my decision. This is actually, I'm not going to go through all the econometrics. This is actually a very clear result. And so you could end up with very large coattails in this election. It's easy to assume the outcome is uncertain. Turnout could be high and so on. The question is, would the margin be big enough? Because coattails, we think of as basically for a given victory, margin of victory, how much per point ahead do you get a seat? How many additional seats do you get? But I'm going to go a little further. And again, I'm drawing on other people's research. But I just want to point out that the correlation between Senate and, to a lesser degree, House races and presidential races has gone up in recent years. And this is very simple. Polarization has increased. If you care about the presidential election and you vote for a given party, you are much more likely than you were in the past to make an independent decision on your senator or on your congressperson. And our friends at 538, I had started writing these slides several days ago, but our friends at 538 actually published a chart, yes, I think yesterday or two days ago, uh, that proves this point. They've done the analysis, and the share of variation in your Senate vote has been steadily going up as polarization is going up. And so that would suggest that the predictive power of coattails is actually going up more strongly at present than it's been. Moreover, even if the election gets muddied by the existence of third and layer, I say fourth party candidates in this current race, you do not have meaningful third and fourth party candidates in congressional and senatorial elections, Bernie Sanders notwithstanding. There is not simply a factor, simply not a factor in the US. And so if anything, the party lines get drawn. You don't have the siphoning off of votes. 
The final point is I'm, I'm just going to, as a victim of Brexit, like many others, um, I am just going to assert that the polling data on Trump's support is unreliable. Now, there is more out there, but again, not to pick on 538, but to their credit, they've been the most transparent about their methods. But the Princeton people as well, of course, have been too. And both of them completely underestimated the extent of Trump's support throughout the primaries. And we know from European and Latin American elections, there is a phenomenon, particularly when there is a right-wing candidate, that people are reluctant to admit that they actually are supporting this person in the polls. The polls systematically underestimate support. We have the more general issue that polling data has broken down because it is only old people who have landlines and actually answer the phone when pollsters call. My wife is actually a former professional pollster. This is, this is true. This makes her life much harder. But the other thing is there's an underlying issue. This is an identity election. We work on the premise when we're doing our work, like our recently released study on trade, that people actually listen to arguments and vote on the basis of policy. That is an ethically sound premise. That is a premise that lets us get up in the morning and feel we're doing something useful. As a matter of forecasting, it may not be the best premise. The best simple forecast for this election is white males with lesser education or outside cities will vote Republican. African Americans and Hispanics will vote Democrat. And the swing vote is non-urban women, white women. And we do not know what the extent of the swing vote is going to be among non-urban white women. All right, so that's the political assumptions I made. So then let's work that through. What happens? So one possibility is that, God forbid, Mr. Trump is elected president. I say that not jokingly. I say that because I cannot say that sentence without saying that. Um, <laughs> In that situation, I think it is reasonable to assume that the Senate has a small Republican majority. The House retains its Republican majority, might even expand. But here's the key assumption, that there are enough Democratic senators left who are scared of what's just happened. And similar to their behavior after W. Bush was elected in 2000 and 9-11, they feel they have to give the president something. Moreover, as some people have pointed out, the Republicans are not afraid to use the reconciliation process to push through their budget, potentially. The reconciliation process, remember, only requires 51 votes to get the budget through, not the 60 votes you normally need. So if we assume the Republicans are willing to do that, and as has been the form for the last 25 years, Democratic senators are more deferential to Republican presidents than Republican senators are to Democratic presidents, we could end up with a budget being passed. Now, I'm going to assume, just for the heck of it, that the chance of Trump winning is greater than 45 percent. 538, as of last night, said 42 percent. And based on their last chart, I'm going to assume that roughly there's about a 75 percent correlation with who wins. And so there is, to me, a genuine 30% chance that Mr. Trump could implement his fiscal package. That's a big package, and that's a big chance. And I'll go through what that means in a moment. On the Democratic side, the chance of it actually coming to pass is much smaller, but I think it's larger than people appreciate. So let us say Mrs. Clinton is elected president. The Senate does get a small Democratic majority. But here is the key point. In this scenario, actually, Mrs. Clinton's hook coattails are longer than people expect, and you gain 15 or more seats in the House, which cuts the Republican majority in half or less. Now, if that happens, I am willing to suggest we are in the midst of a realignment. And so then there are enough, you only need a few Republican Congress people to change to be scared, to be intimidated, to be bribable, to get your bill through. Now, this is probably the most suspect assumption I am making. Very smart people, like Amy Walter, for example, who writes for Charlie Cook Report, various others, will point to the fact that these Republicans just hate government, hate Clinton, not going to happen. Um, I think the more sound point people like that would make, which makes me have pause, is that given the way our districts are drawn, 
it is possible what happens is what remains of the moderate Republican House members are the ones who actually lose in this scenario, and it is only the extreme Republican House members who remain. I admit, as I said, I think this is, this is a potentially incorrect assumption. But I would ask you to just you know, put in your mind, imagine you have a five-point victory for Clinton, which is not out of the realm of question. Imagine you have a gain of 15-plus seats in the House. Imagine that this involves essentially a recognition that a large share of the business supporters have left the Republican Party. Could you possibly want to see a Congress as a Republican congressperson that actually passes a budget? I think under that scenario, it is possible. But again, I don't put a very high chance on it. I think it's only 10%. But if we put this together, this means we've got roughly a 40% chance of there being some sizable financial fiscal stimulus in 2017-2018 coming out of the US. Both candidates support infrastructure investment. The Clinton plan, which others have analyzed, including our friends across the street at Brookings and, and the, the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget and so on, um, is, is largely fully funded. But if you assume that even these well-meaning Republican compromisers want to extract something on tax hikes, you could expect some net stimulus in excess of what Dave was assuming. So instead of just a tenth of a percent of GDP, something more like four tenths of a percent of GDP. Mr. Trump's plan is a huge budget blowout. Um, I mean, there's just no other way to put it. it. It is an enormous set of tax cuts as well as large spending increases. And in the long term, they're unsustainable. But anyway, in the short term, it would mean you'd get a net stimulus of at least 1% of GDP, if you believe the numbers that he's putting out there, which you know, are what they are. But I want to also emphasize, and this goes back to Dave's last slide and is an issue that we've started working on and will continue to work on through the next year or two. All these fiscal assumptions, all of everybody's forecasts have not marked down their productivity growth numbers enough, in my opinion. So even my good friend David, in his last slide, he shows you, well, his red dot is, what, half a percent or more higher than what it's been the last few years. Um, as Olivier, Olivier Blanchard has pointed out in his article that we just published, you know, I, it, there's no reason it couldn't just come back. We, the 95 to 2005 period was manna from heaven. We could get manna from heaven again. I, however, and our colleagues at the Central Cl C Congressional Budget Office have been starting to think this through, I know as well, have been saying, well, you know, if you look at the average over the last 20 years, there's a lot more dates that look like today than yesterday. And the fact that business investment, as Dave never relied on his forecasts. Business fixed investment has not come back, seems to be a revealed forecast by the business community that there isn't that much productivity to be gained near term. And that's persisted long after the crisis, long after balance sheets have repaired. That's a discussion for another day. But just to say that if you are wrong, if we are wrong in the forecast about productivity, we're gonna be wrong in the forecast about tax revenue, we're gonna be wrong in the forecast about tax revenue to the downside, the net fiscal impulse in the short term will be larger. So everybody should be reconsidering their assumption that we're going to get almost nothing on fiscal policy. So how does the Federal Reserve react? As we sort of discussed when we released our trade study by Nolan, Huffbauer, Robinson, and Moran last week, most of the mainstream models, Oxford Analytics, uh, Moody's, Mark Zandi, Lou Alexander's use at Nomura, all these various models, they depend crucially for your forecast on how does the Fed react when you get this kind of fiscal stimulus. And this is stuff I actually supposedly know something about, so you might pay attention to this slide, if not the others. I mean, the first assumption has to be that the clear majority of the current FOMC believes the economy is at risk of overheating. As Dave points out, this is the forecast. This is not the recommendation. But if you look at the statements of my friend Eric, genuine friend Eric Rosengren, or Vice Chair Fisher in recent days, they are telling you, got to move now, labor markets are tightening, got to be ahead of inflation. And so the fiscal stimulus, if it sharply raises growth and at least short-term inflation, in, in, especially in the Trump scenario, would presumably elicit a Fed tightening. 
Now, they're not going to move in advance of a budget being passed. And there is some lag between when the Fed tightens and all that, and we can get into that. But they will sir, almost certainly tighten in such a scenario. Now, two additional factors that might lead them to tighten even more. If Mr. Trump's policy proposals or anything close to them on fiscal policy are implemented, this is a huge long-term erosion in the sustainability of the fiscal position in the United States. Leave aside any rhetoric about defaulting and renegotiating debt. But let's not even go there. Just straight up, check out the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Straight up, it's a huge 10-year hit. There is precedent for central banks, a little more than to my own taste, but as a matter of forecasting, to take that into account. Think about the fact that Greenspan Rubin had their pseudo agreement in the early 90s that because the US government was the then Clinton administration was turning out surpluses or closing the deficit, Greenspan was more willing to ease up on tightening. Do they assume further labor supply reduction? Now, Dave gave you some charts, and we've, as he mentioned, talked about this issue numerous times in this venue. If Mr. Trump's policies on immigration go through, one has to assume a significant hit to at least labor force growth, if not an outright contraction in effective labor force. That, again, would lead you to be more tightening from the Fed because you're more at risk of overheating for a given level of growth. Now, we talked previously about the Trump trade measures. That's more questionable because it puts upward pressure on the dollar, potentially. China has no reason to hold back on letting the currency go down. Mexican currency would certainly be punished in foreign markets if those trade measures went through. In which case, you have upward pressure on the dollar. You have temporary rise in inflation. The net effect on the Fed is probably mixed, not clear. But I'm saying that in this scenario, I think we end up with a version of Reagan Volcker. And it would be worse than the original. Why is it worse than the original? It's not worse than the original in the sense that we're not starting with double-digit inflation and Mr. Volcker having to raise rates, or I shouldn't say Mr. Volcker, the Federal Reserve having to raise rates to double digits. That's obviously not the case. The reason it would be the case that it would be worse relates to Dave's point, which he has made in the last few Global Outlook sessions, and which he's right about, that the economy itself and the resiliency of it is not as good as it was in the past. It's probably better than it was in 2010, certainly. And the capacity to withstand, to use reverse policies, use policy tools, is more limited. Moreover, this is a world in which the US would be truly going its own idiosyncratic way, which would probably amplify the trade deficit effects that we saw under Reagan Volcker, and the amount of cooperation we would have from our friends and even our enemies would be less than under Reagan Volcker, which led to Plaza. So I think it's potentially a very bad outcome. But let me turn back now to something that is sort of the modal forecast. And here's where I end, and it will, I think, set up nicely Jacob and others. Maybe, even if it's Mr. Trump, we end up with a better global policy mix by accident. So the G20 has been right to call for a switch from monetary to fiscal stimulus. We keep saying that. Nobody ever does it. Maybe we're actually going to have it. It, of course, also is right, if you're ever going to do any public investment, do it when interest rates are low. I call this the duh argument, OK? This is the duh argument. But I think the key point is we're actually moving to a world where people, for their own independent reasons, are moving to fiscal stimulus. So China is maintaining, depends how you measure it, fiscal stimulus perhaps in the order of 1% of GDP a year. Japan, thanks to Olivier and me and a few other influential people, including, of course, the prime minister, um, is going to be stimulating at least a half a percent of GDP over the next couple of years. Germany, as Jacob will explain, is finally going off the Schwarz and Null and is actually going to do a little bit more and may be forced to by migration events as well as other things. The UK, uh, Theresa May has perhaps conveniently, but also supported by the evidence, effectively repudiated the previous austerity package and they really want to make people happy in the face of Brexit. 
I think there's going to be a very sizable fiscal stimulus package coming shortly. France has an election. In elections, they generally stimulate a few tenths of a percent of GDP. Italy is going to do a bank bailout, get a break from the European Commission. They're going to stimulate a few tenths. Again, Jacob will take you through this. And Canada, everybody's favorite matinee idol of fiscal policy, Justin Trudeau, has campaigned on the fact he was going to do a fiscal stimulus package. Now, each of these, they vary in size. Not all of them are huge. But remember, this would be the first time since arguably 2010 when we had simultaneous fiscal stimulus. And there are huge benefits to that. You get less leakage of your own policy abroad, and you get less distortion of exchange rates and, and trade effects coming out of this because everybody's moving in the same direction. You also arguably, as a result of those two processes, get higher multipliers on what you're doing. So you get a bigger impact. And if you really want to be optimistic of the DeLong Summers type camp, which I hope is right, although I'm not sure it is, you can argue that this improves your trend growth rate Y star, might even improve your equilibrium interest rate R star. So this is where I conclude that, remember, I was talking about the 40% likelihood. 60% likelihood, I was still assuming what Dave assumed, that we have a responsible fiscal policy from Mrs. Clinton as president. We have deadlock in the Congress. We get basically nothing on stimulus. That could blow a huge opportunity. And I would encourage Secretary Clinton in the event that she is in, and in the event she has some hope of passing a budget, which she has to try, that she be a little less responsible than she's currently promising to be. Nothing about destroying the 10-year budget outlook with huge unsustainable tax cuts, but going with the global wave and the US G20 commitment to expand fiscal investment and thereby take advantage of this global opportunity. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about the outlook for US-China economic relations uh, in light of the election and how the coming years are likely to be somewhat different from uh, where we have been uh, in uh, the last, call it 15 years, since, since China joined the WTO in, in 2001. Um, so I'm going to first lay out, as I see it, the, the challenges we did face, the challenges we will face, talk a little about uh, what we have heard on the campaign trail from the two candidates. Um, no, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the, uh, the famous Donald Trump video, which consists of him saying the word China a lot of times. But you know, obviously, China has been a, an important theme uh, in both of their campaigns. Um, and then finally, uh, discuss what the impact of actually implementing those policies could be. So first of all, um, as you can clearly tell from the campaign rhetoric on both sides, the currency issue has dominated uh, the uh, agenda, the US agenda in its uh, economic relationship with China for many years. I've got a chart up there that shows the, the path of the RMB under different measures, both the bilateral and, the, uh, and, and a couple of uh, trade-weighted uh, measures of the exchange rate. This is ending in 2014, which was basically the, the peak of the RMB. And what you saw was that uh, the RMB um, as China entered the WTO, and especially in the early 2000s, was, went through a period of very substantial undervaluation. This coincided with um, uh, China's uh, obvious uh, opening up to, uh, to, to, to foreign trade and investment. And so if there would already have been a substantial incentive to begin to include China in global value chains and, and to, to move some amount of, of, of manufacturing production to China just because it was a big new player and you're introducing hundreds of millions of workers into the global division of labor. But the fact that you had policies in China that, that, that gave you an additional 
competitive advantage there by, through cu currency undervaluation, arguably exacerbated that, that impact. And so we've now seen the first round of academic research going county by county and seeing what the impact has been on manufacturing employment in the United States. So, um, so that has been an, very much a dominant issue in the, uh, the US-China uh, discussion. Um, I think that uh, the Obama administration would argue that there has been a substantial amount of success in gradually moving um, China to a, a more market-determined exchange rate. And what I, you can't see on this chart, but in, obviously in the recent two years, uh, the uh, RMB has moved to a very different position where now arguably the market wants to push the RMB weaker rather than stronger. And so the argument that China is substantially undervalued and that that is creating incentives for, um, for, for offshoring and for manufacturing to move to China no longer is quite as, uh, as persuasive as, as it was uh, for much of the last 15 years. Second issue that I flag here, which has been an ongoing um, uh, point of friction between the two countries is intellectual property rights and, and uh, the uh, concern about uh, whether the Chinese government is A, essentially taking a tolerant attitude to, to, to IPR theft, to the theft of, uh, of, of, of trade secrets, of business confidential information. Um, in addition, the idea that in many cases, in order to win contracts, to, to, to win business in China, um, there has been a strong bias towards pressuring companies to transfer their intellectual property to, um, to China, to, to set up joint ventures in which uh, Chinese essentially learn how to, um, to, to, to produce and then eventually the they, they, they dispense with their joint venture partners and indigenize the, uh, the innovation that was, uh, was, was, was uh, developed overseas. So that has also been a very serious concern for policymakers um, and a, a central part of the, the, the regular dialogue between the two countries. The, the third element that I call out here, which has um, also been a very central part of the discussions, is um, is, is the issue of the Chinese market and the discriminatory uh, policies that China has used to advantage local national champions and state-owned enterprises. And, uh, but really, over the last 15 years, the, the battleground, if you like, has been um, access to China itself rather than um, the, the, the more global market that we're now seeing uh, be, as, as, as the point of contention. So now, um, what I would argue for in, in the coming period, uh, currency is not going to be the dominant issue uh, in economic terms, certainly, even if uh, that is, is one that uh, still looms large in the political rhetoric. Um, in fact, a far greater concern, um, my colleague Nick Lardy's relatively benign forecast notwithstanding, but the consequences of, of some kind of macroeconomic accident in China are so serious for the global economy and for the US economy that encouraging China to adopt policies that rapidly shift the growth model towards a consumption-based um, economy away from excessive investment in uh, infrastructure in real estate, which has driven a very rapid increase in the in the debt level over the last uh, several years, um, and continues to, uh, to 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 rise at an impressive rate. That will be, I think, a central piece of the uh, of, of the dialogue between the United States and China. Um, the second is, and this is we've already seen this this year, and this is is quite related to the first, is that China's policies over the last few years, um, its stimulus policies that um, led to an explosion in infrastructure investment, real estate investment, in their, on their coattails, they led to the vast expansion of manufacturing industries to supply those sectors. Steel, cement, glass, aluminum. And as China's investment 
tapers off, that has led to a huge overcapacity in those sectors, which in turn has put very substantial deflationary pressure on global prices in those sectors. And that is a political issue for the United States, for our European partners and for many other countries. Um, the Obama administration has had discussions bilaterally with China. In the OECD, China attended uh, a meeting earlier this year. Now, mo most recently in the G20 and the recent uh, presidential bilateral summit, um, this issue of overcapacity and addressing it is, is, is going to be continue to be, I think, a very central part of the bilateral discussions. And third, um, whereas the battleground, as I was saying before, um, over the last 15 years has really been access to the China's market, going forward for U.S. policymakers, the larger concern will be uh, Chinese industrial policies that aim to break U.S. dominance in a number of key strategic sectors, including semiconductors, including uh, various forms of advanced manufacturing, biotechnology, and even aircraft manufacturing. And these are, this is not just a question of who will be supplying to Chinese consumers. This is really a question of, of who is supplying to the world market. And these are, are areas where the United States in m many cases had a very comfortable dominant position for many decades, obviously not alone in aircraft manufacturing has shared a duopoly with Europe, but um, where China has a very clearly stated ambition to expand in these areas and where um, the United States is going to ha have to think very carefully about whether it needs to um, act in the face of government policies on the other side, whether it can afford to take a laissez-faire approach as it has done uh, largely until now. So just to take a, a, a brief moment to discuss what, how the United States actually can influence Chinese behavior, because that is the first question that the next president is going to have to ask his or her advisors when he or she gets into the Oval Office is, you know, what can we actually do? Because it's not as if China is, is doing what we tell them or ask them. China is obviously going to be doing policies that it sees in its, as in its own interest. So the most powerful, arguably, form of leverage, which is one that, uh, that, that Mr. Trump has, has implicitly uh, invoked in his uh, discussions of China is that China values access to the U.S. market. And you could say that China should value access to the U.S. market more than the United States values access to Chinese, the Chinese market simply because China exports the equivalent of 5% of its GDP to the United States, while the United States exports only 1% of our GDP to China. So a very crude um, model of, of, of a trade war would say that the United States wins. Now, and that seems to be the implicit assumption of, of Mr. Trump's threat to impose 45% tariffs on Chinese imports. Now, um, the reality is that um, access to the U.S. market is a very blunt instrument. It cuts both ways. Needless to say that cutting off Chinese exports to the United States is very painful to the United States, even, without, even in the absence of Chinese retaliation. Um, and it's also something that is tightly regulated by our responsibilities as members of the World Trade Organization. And so using access, market access, as a cudgel um, in such a way as could potentially put us in violation of the system that we have created um, ca could have very serious global consequences that um, would also have negative implications for our economy. So it's something that is far less useful as a, as a tool than, than might seem at first glance. A second form of, of influence that we could have over China is 
that the Chinese are acquiring US technologies. They're in very rapidly increasing their investment in the United States. And these are things that the Chinese government has made clear it would like to continue and to, if anything, be able to expand. The United States at the moment regulates some acquisition of technology through export controls, and it regulates some Chinese investment in the United States through the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the CFIUS process. But both of those are essentially narrowly construed to be focused on national security, and they don't take into account questions of economic competitiveness or, um, or, or counteracting industrial policy. And that is, that is a tool that the United States has not chosen to use until now. It's taken, as I was saying, a relatively laissez-faire approach outside uh, the area of national security. But it is something that I think the next president will have to think hard about. Um, the third tool, which I think has arguably been far and away the most effective way of influencing Chinese behavior is that China has shown a very strong interest in moving, in, in, in acceding to the institutions of global economic governance and becoming a fully fledged member of every global economic club. So, you know, the most obvious and well known example is China's accession to the WTO, which um, and you can certainly argue that, that, that China has perhaps not complied with the spirit of, of WTO membership in every instance, but it has certainly changed the way that the Chinese economy is, uh, is structured and the way China operates globally. We've seen that very recently with um, the uh, inclusion of the Chinese RMB in the uh, IMF special drawing rights basket, which led to a series of changes in the way that China um, uh, organize its exchange rate regime and, and um, behaved in that respect. And arguably, if we were to pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which obviously is a very big if at this point, um, then by design, what the TPP does is it fixes and closes a lot of the loopholes in the existing system that the accession of China to the WTO has revealed or highlighted. And there's little doubt in my mind that if TPP were passed, that we would be in a position in, over the coming years where China would be aspiring to adjust its economy in such a way as to join TPP. And that itself would, would be a powerful form of influence. The last point here is that um, China obviously has leverage over the United States as well. Um, Secretary Clinton famously said that it's difficult to negotiate with your banker. I, I think that that's actually a misplaced understanding of, of where Chinese leverage lies. I don't think that it's because China uh, holds a trillion dollars worth of US uh, security or uh, uh, treasury bills. In fact, um, there are almost certainly other willing buyers of those um, treasuries if, if, if China decides to sell them. The real influence that China has over us is that the US business community has sunk very deep roots into China. China is part of the supply chains of almost every manufacturing sector that you can identify. And for those supply chains to be disrupted would be extremely um, uh, damaging to the U.S. economy and to the U.S. corporate sector. So a moment on what, what the candidates are actually saying. So these, these quotes are drawn from Mr. Trump's website. Um, I inserted one bracketed number, which was the 45% uh, number for the, uh, the tariff that Trump is threatening to, um, to impose. That's something he said and something that his advisors have written about. He's also talked about doing a zero tolerance policy on IPR violations and uh, to um, eliminate China's illegal export subsidies and put an end to um, China's lax environmental and labor standards. So what would that actually do? Well, as I've said, I think a 45% tariff would be clearly violating our, our, uh, the United States WTO obligations, so it would really put the uh, entire global trading system under strain, uh, 
my colleagues have written, uh, have done uh, some uh, estimates of the impact of, on a, of, of a trade war in the United States, and the short version of it is it's big and negative. Um, zero tolerance on IPR. We already have zero tolerance on IPR. The challenge is that when IPR violations take place in foreign countries, um, we rely on the cooperation of those foreign countries and we have limited tools at the US border to, to, um, to actually enforce that. And so hence um, the limits of the unilateral approach. And third, um, on ending illegal export subsidies, that's something that the US Trade Representative's Office does all the time in the WTO. Although the other part about environmental and labor standards is something a little new. I'll just be very quick. So what Clinton is saying, Clinton wants to impose, in, introduce a new trade prosecutor. She wants to expand our tool, toolbox to address currency manipulation, again, the currency issue. And she wants to refuse to treat China as a market economy. These are things that she could do. Um, she would rely on Congress to expand, uh, she'd have to rely on Congress to expand uh, trade enforcement, but, but basically these are within the realm of, of, of the possible. Obviously what she does on currency manipulation would, um, the details are very important as to whether that would put us in violation of, of WTO. And China and the United States have different views on market economy status, but um, it's clear that China believes it's entitled to it and will likely take the United States and the EU to the WTO um, after December of this year um, if and when we continue to consider China a non-market economy. So just to conclude, the summary is that pretty much regardless of, of who is elected, um, it's clear that U.S.-China economic relations are going to go through a rough patch. Um, there's a, been a lot of talk in this campaign about um, unilateralism, more, more unilateral action against China, um, and taking a tougher stance. And um, I think that it's safe to say that that's what we will see some version of that. Second point is the 45% tariff threat. If I were them, I don't think I'd take that seriously because the consequences would be so devastating. But if the United States were to follow through on that threat, um, it's hard to imagine the Chinese simply rolling over and accepting that. They, they would need to retaliate, and so I would expect that that to happen. Third point is that there is, in the rhetoric, a very heavy emphasis on unilateralism, but there are limits to what a unilateral approach can actually achieve, which, as I've been saying, a lot of things Chinese policies, Chinese economic policies are obviously um, within China's control, but also enforcement of things like uh, IPR rely on the cooperation of the Chinese authorities in China. And the final point is that, as I said, arguably the most powerful tool we have is that the US has been such a leader in drawing up global rules and insofar as we step away from that, abandon TPP, abandon um, our effort to create a global system in our image, then we will lose what, is, what has been our most powerful uh, instrument for influencing Chinese behavior. Thank you. Well. Well, thank you very much. And I guess I, at the outset, should say that uh, when we initially uh, decided to put European political economy challenges on the program, Hillary was up 10% and people were talking about a landslide. Uh, so it's hard for me to not feel a little bit upstage and, and basically conclude that Europe has been trumped uh, on the sort of political drama and entertainment factor recently, at least. So my main task, uh, therefore, in the quickly here is to leave you with uh, uh, the impression that actually Europe does have some serious challenges ahead, but also as Dave and, and Adam alluded to, that actually there is probably, at least in terms of fiscal stimulus, some potential upside uh, from this. So very quickly, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, Brexit, and then really what I see as a, an election super cycle in Europe, and then finally what it means for the uh, uh, policy stance uh, in Europe. 
Now, in the short run uh, to Brexit, it's very clear that what has it meant? Well, we know from Theresa May that it means Brexit, but in the real economy, it hasn't meant uh, very much. The short-term indicators have been very good. These are the uh, PMIs that you can see clearly rebounded uh, after a, a, de a, re a, um, a very short-term blip. Uh, momentum in the UK economy seems to uh, have sustained it so far. Uh, there are also other explanations. Uh, Adam's colleagues at the Bank of England recently uh, said that, well, the weather uh, in the UK has been very nice in August and September. Um, consumers have clearly uh, felt very well, which pundits like myself should clearly probably not be so surprised about, given that consumers are also voters, and the majority of voters uh, should feel good about the outcome, even if it clearly went against what uh, my predictions uh, were. Um, and then, of course, the Bank of England and, as Adam said, uh, the UK government is likely to deliver significant uh, uh, macro stimulus <coughs> in the coming months, or the Bank of England actually already has done so. Um, so it's fair to say that the uh, Brexit fear campaign scenario hasn't played out in the short run. But I guess I would actually argue that that is one of the factors that creates the political momentum for some of the worst or longer term outcome. Because it is, in my opinion, precisely the lack of a short term economic uh, failure or decline that, create, that pushes the political momentum for what I see uh, as the uh, long run effect uh, uh, for Brexit, which will uh, therefore be all the more uh, serious. And uh, very clearly, we've already seen it, investment and employment growth have been slowing uh, in the UK. But perhaps more ominously, there is zero, absolutely zero progress on any of the big three political agreements that needs to be struck as part of Brexit. The domestic uh, UK agreement about what do they actually want from Article 50, then the Article 50 negotiations about leaving the EU with the EU member states, and then the longer term prospects about what is the longer uh, uh, term relationship going to be. Instead, we actually have what I would call uh, a regression. I mean, just this week we heard uh, the UK foreign minister in Turkey saying that the UK would work to support Turkish membership of the EU. We also heard this week the British uh, defense minister saying that the UK would continue to oppose an EU common defense policy. So these are not things that set up for a constructive uh, negotiating framework uh, for any of this. Um, and then, there we go. Finally, I think if you listen to Theresa May, uh, what she has said, which isn't very much, but uh, uh, she clearly seems to be on the side of the argument that says that Brexit uh, uh, means immigration controls. And if, if you take that as a domestic given in the UK, and then you add to it uh, the very clear announcement by now a, a great number of EU leaders that if you restrict immigration, well, then it means no access to the uh, 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 internal market. Uh, then the verdict in the end of where this ends becomes relatively clear, in my opinion. We are headed for a hard exit, a hard Brexit, which means probably no or very limited, uh, at least in my opinion, uh, potentially only to goods, access to uh, uh, internal market. There will be no passporting uh, uh, for the financial services sector. And uh, there will also be, I think, a very limited transition period for this, uh, for the simple reason that if you want a meaningful transition period, you basically need to keep uh, open uh, free movement of labor, which, as I said uh, earlier, I don't think is politically sustainable uh, in the UK. So uh, the base case is hard Brexit, uh, uh, which uh, I certainly believe is both politically and economically the uh, very suboptimal outcome of where we, uh, where we could be for this Brexit. Uh, situation and clearly it'll be an outcome that will uh, disproportionately and negatively affect the financial services industry in London, perhaps uh, uh, less so on the uh, UK manufacturing sector. Meanwhile, turning to the uh, broader Euro area elections, I mean, there's always an election somewhere in Europe. There's always an election even in the Euro area. But I think it's really important to recognize that if you look over the next 12 months or so, you have all the big countries 
having national election events. Um, <clears throat> you have Italy with a referendum now set for late uh, uh, early December. You have a likely, I say, uh, likely Spanish third election around Christmas. You have the Netherlands in March, and then France and Germany in the spring uh, uh, and summer. Uh, that all adds up to, and then if you throw in the Austrian presidential election, again, postponed till December, you end up with uh, over 85% of Euro area GDP voting uh, in the next 12 months. Um, and this has significant uh, implications, I would argue, for fiscal policy. Uh, actually, just today, we heard, we got an indication of how, why uh, Prime Minister Renzi, uh, how he's going to intend to win his election, uh, his referendum, sorry, because he announced that the Italian government is going to devote 6 billion euros towards early retirement provisions, basically uh, partly reversing the 2012 pension reforms introduced by Mario Monti. Uh, we also heard the French government uh, is going to projecting 3.3% deficit this year, uh, uh, only falling to 2.7% uh, next year. But again, I, I don't think uh, uh, because of the reasons that Adam mentioned, uh, the pro-cyclicality of French elections in election year is a, is, is a fairly significantly, a fairly strong historical trend, and I think it will continue. Um, so the elections itself, the staggering of them itself, uh, uh, is a significant and, I think, powerful fiscal uh, stimulative effect. But there is another one uh, uh, that I actually think is more important, because this is not your normal elections substantively in, uh, the, uh, uh, in the EU or in the UK. Now, on this slide, uh, don't actually, it's a good thing that you can't read what's on the a slide here, because what I put up here is the entire election program of the populist Dutch Freedom Party. It's a one-pager uh, uh, that basically spells it out. And it includes things like a complete ban on asylum, so we're going to close the border. They want to close every mosque and Islamic school in the Netherlands. They want to ban the Quran. They want to take the country out of the EU. Uh, and at the same time, they want to uh, uh, cap the retirement ages and spend a lot more money on uh, old age and health care. So this is, in many ways, a truly radical party uh, whose program basically contravenes uh, European law and a whole bunch of other things. Yet, pretty much every poll in the Netherlands right now have them running as the biggest party uh, uh, in the country. Uh, then, of course, uh, over... On the right, you have uh, uh, an indication that, uh, unlike in the US, where, of course, uh, Hillary Clinton is uh, the sort of candidate uh, in the election for the establishment, uh, the, that is not uh, where female candidates are in the two main uh, elections in the Eurozone, in France and Germany. And I really do believe uh, that at least I think that in Germany, where it's a new thing, the, uh, this is uh, Frauke Petri, the head of the Alternative für Deutschland party, that is where you have an, a, a significant uh, longer-term political shift uh, coming. Because AFD, which recently polled 12% of the vote in very cosmopolitan Berlin, so this is not a party that only does well, you know, in mecklenburg vorpommern and some of the other uh, former Eastern European states, or East German states. It actually, in my opinion, is, is almost certain to get into the uh, uh, German uh, uh, Bundestag with a potentially significant uh, 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 representation. Um, and what this does is that both in the Netherlands and in Germany, which are two countries that traditionally sort of characterized by the fiscally conservative core euro area uh, group, um, which have been governed by explicitly uh, grand coalitions for the last uh, many years. The emergence of these uh, uh, parties uh, are going to be able, are going to create, make uh, domestic politics, in my opinion, much more difficult. Uh, and it's going to maintain the uh, tight fiscal policy also far more difficult. Because as highlighted by the program of the Dutch Freedom Party, which is essentially a welfare chauvinistic uh, program that basically wants to kick out foreigners and spend a lot of money uh, on uh, uh, older workers and blue collar workers, these are parties that 
very quickly uh, will become the largest blue collar worker parties uh, in, uh, in the countries. And that puts significant political pressure on the center left members of grand coalitions, namely the SPD uh, and the Labour Party in the Netherlands, which ultimately, as I said, means that these grand coalitions in the core euro area countries will not uh, be nearly as able to sustain the relatively tight fiscal policies that they have promoted and themselves implemented uh, in the euro area going forward. Um, so this is, in my opinion, a structural political economy shift in the core of the euro area economies. Uh, what does it mean? Well, uh, it certainly means that what you see here, uh, uh, that is going to uh, change going forward. This is a chart that shows you contributions to GDP. Uh, and the red here uh, is uh, fiscal, <coughs> oh, sorry, the green here is the public sector consumption, and the gray areas here are essentially those parts of it that are uh, predominantly affected by monetary policy. So it's, it's fair to say that uh, the euro area has been overwhelmingly relying on uh, monetary stimulus uh, going forward. But as I said, I would argue that that uh, is going to change. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, because the politics in many of these elections, particularly in the core euro area countries, are shifting, and they, uh, there are things that are worse than uh, running bigger deficits uh, in these countries, and that will be become increasingly clearer for the grand coalitions in the uh, core European, or the austere core, as I say it here. The second one is that, and I don't have time to go into the details of it, but basically monetary policy stimulus, in my opinion, in the euro area has maxed out. Uh, you're not going to get much more from the ECB. You may very well get a continuation of current levels of stimulus uh, towards the end of 2017, but I don't believe you're going to get any more. Uh, so from that perspective, euro area policymakers really don't have much choice uh, than to shift to other alternative uh, uh, measures. And then finally, of course, uh, we saw over the summer that the Stability and Growth Pact, which uh, was you know, renegotiated over the last five or six years since the beginning of the crisis, is dead again. Uh, uh, it was once again buried uh, uh, largely I would argue, at the instigation of Wolfgang Schäuble, when the commission did not ultimately slap fines on Spain and Portugal. So all these things basically tell me that, uh, from a political economy point of view, the euro area is going to be heading for a more proactive uh, fiscal uh, policy and a more stimulative stance. So what does it mean? Well, fundamentally, very quickly, Brexit. I think the hit is still to come. And as I said, you shouldn't expect an amicable divorce, and hard Brexit is the base case. Uh, the super cycle will uh, materially change domestic politics in the core uh, and therefore facilitate uh, more stimulative policies. And the euro area, <coughs> sorry, uh, but finally, therefore, going forward for the broader policy mix in the euro area, the challenge, uh, as I see it at least, given that I believe fiscal stimulus is coming, is to frame a reform narrative that basically ensures, uh, uh, rather than debate the general uh, timing of structural reform or fiscal policy relative to structural reforms, framing a narrative that says, look, fiscal stimulus is coming, so we really ought to do accompanying fiscal, uh, sorry, structural reforms because it will help pay for uh, a part of these uh, fiscal stimulus in the long run. And I think I'll end there. Thank you. Let me institutionally apologize for having run over our time uh, slot here so egregiously this afternoon. Let me propose the following. For those of you that need to run to catch your Uber or meet your next appointment, feel free to get up at this point and take off. But um, we're going to stay here until 2 o'clock to answer questions. For those of you who have the word of the week, I guess, stamina to uh, hang around and, uh, and pose any. So... Uh, We have both a roaming mic and a mic at the back. Please, if you have a question, identify yourself uh, and your organization, and we will attempt to answer them. Yes, at the back. Hello. I'm Gonzalo Garcia from the Embassy of Spain. This is a, a question for you, David, about the U.S. economy. <coughs> with an, um, 
final numbers today for the second quarter GDP. We have, I think, uh, five consecutive quarters of uh, decrease in inventories. This is quite unusual. Uh, and I would like to ask you, what do you make of it? And, and what is the impact on the forecast that, uh, that you have given us, and particularly for the next three or four quarters? Thank you. So I think what we saw in part on the inventory side was with the appreciation of the dollar, there was a backup, especially in the goods producing sector uh, in inventories associated with a fall off in the pace of sales. Uh, at this point, it looks like most of that backlog has now been worked off. And indeed, I think the inventory adjustment is now largely behind us. And that is one reason why I think we could see a step up in the pace of activity here in the second half. So I don't think, um, I don't think the implications um, are large going forward. Nevertheless, it was a surprise how la large that inventory contraction. I think one could take a, a relatively um, positive view of it and say, we went through that adjustment. We actually got that inventory adjustment without triggering a more serious contraction and output in the economy. It's exactly that kind of thing, a surprise in sales, a backup in inventories that quite frequently is associated with the uh, recession, which we didn't have this time around. Thank you. Up front here. Joe Bolio with uh, Brevin Howard. This is a question for Dave. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on your comfort level of the coherency of three parts of the forecast, increase in interest rates, uh, modest growth rate in inflation, and what I assume to be a flat exchange rate? Roughly speaking, a, a, a flat exchange rate. Um, look, I think the increase in interest rates is designed to slow the, de the decline in the unemployment rate and slow the uh, taking up of slack in the economy. But it, at this point, it's un it appears that the unemployment rate and labor market probably has overshot on the low side. I think that is going to generate some upward pressure. I think we, if we're seeing it already on the labor market side. Um, and the transitory factors that have been holding down inflation are now largely behind us. So I see those things fitting together in a world in which very modest increases in interest rates can be consistent with an economy that continues to grow a little above potential, takes up some slack, and puts some upper pressure on inflation at this point. Um, when you say how comfortable am I with that, I think as you can tell from those pictures that I showed, the pickup in wage and price inflation is still more projection than fact at this point. And so I think there has to be some question about whether or not uh, um, you know, that's going to continue. And, and as I said earlier, one of the reasons why, while I'm forecasting the Fed to pretty much do what it says it's going to do at this point, um, I wouldn't recommend that because, in fact, I think there is probably more uncertainty about the upward pressure on inflation uh, uh, that is warranted at this point, and allowing the economy to run for a little further uh, would probably seem wise, in my, in my opinion. At the back, and then I'll come. Hi, I'm Chen Wei from China Daily. I have a question for Laurie. I mean, you were in the Obama administration for a long time, but now you're a scholar. I want to you comment on what if uh, the chances of for China to win over WTO case, I mean, over market economy, if they really take on the heavy weight Europe and the United States. And secondly, I don't know if to everyone who wants to comment, Christine Lagarde tomorrow is going to announce formally the IMB is going to be the SDR basket. So what does that mean for China? I mean, should China celebrate or what's the challenge? I mean, what are your advice? I mean, what do you think Chinese should think about it? Thank you. So on the first question, I, um, I'm not a lawyer uh, and certainly not a, uh, an international trade lawyer. So I, I can't give a probabilistic assessment of China's chance of victory in the WTO. What I can say is that I've read the text of China's WTO accession protocol and the plain meaning of the words does not seem to commit the United States or the EU to, um, to, to, to making China 
a market economy starting from this December. That's just simply not what it says. Now, I can't predict how a WTO panel is going to interpret that. But, uh, but again, I mean, it seems like there are some required changes implied by the language in the, in the WTO accession protocol, but they do not require market economy status to be granted. On the second question, um, the inclusion of the RMB in the SDR is um, arguably puts a lot of new responsibilities on China. Uh, and there are some that are laid out in the requirements for SDR membership, but then there's, a, I, I think, uh, some broader um, implicit responsibilities that go along with being um, an SDR country. And those basically come down to the way China thinks of its um, thinks of its currency and thinks of its economic management as you know in global terms, and so um, it it does mean that you know China has taken on these responsibilities and and very much now going forward will have to um, bear in mind its global responsibilities in the conduct of its exchange rate policy and and more broadly its uh, its macroeconomic policy management. Just perhaps one other uh, to the first question. I mean, I think uh, on the EU's position on market economy, I think if you read and listened to the EU trade ministers earlier this week in Bratislava, particularly the uh, trade commissioner, Malmström, uh, uh, you can see that there's, the EU is spending a lot of time and effort to create, uh, establish alternative trade remedy measures uh, including upcoming uh, new proposals by the Commission for a legal or a legal proposal. Uh, uh, it would suggest to me that uh, that would only really be needed if the EU is in fact going to uh, grant uh, China uh, market economy status, uh, maybe not by December, but relatively uh, uh, in the relatively near future. Here in the front. Thank you. Krishna Guha with Evercore Partners. If I may, a, a very quick question for Rory and a quick one for Jacob as well. So for Rory, in the event of aggressive action being taken by a Trump administration uh, to target China, obviously there's a, there's a suite of retaliatory options they could choose from. Everything from letting the currency slide to dumping US treasuries to targeted retaliation against Boeing or some of the things that were discussed last week. Uh, through sort of more geopolitical uh, actions to push back against the U.S., can you walk us through how you think about that menu and what would, what in your mind would govern the selection from that menu? And then just for Jacob, a very quick one, which is uh, what you say makes enormous sense in terms of the domestic politics of each country. But I had perhaps simplistically thought that the rise of populist movements in Germany and in the Netherlands made it harder, not easier, for Germany and the Netherlands to agree to uh, the peripheral states, you know, taking more liberties within the stability and growth pact. So why am I wrong on that? I can't claim to know China's thinking on exactly how it would respond um, or to predict exactly where it would look on the menu. The one broad comment I would make is that in U.S. interactions with China, China has, chi the nature of China's political system is such that it, it has certain advantages in a trade war scenario. First and foremost, that it is not bound by a whole host of legal constraints in its domestic system in the way we are. Um, and arguably, while politics and vested interests are obviously very important in China over the medium term. Nonetheless, uh, the Chinese leadership's ability to take action that causes short-term pain in China in order to get uh, a geopolitical outcome is arguably greater than, than ours. Uh, another way of putting it is that I would um, think that they have a higher pain threshold than we do. So in the past, when we've seen retaliations, China has clearly thought very carefully about which sectors it thinks are most vulnerable, which sectors would cause us the most political blowback. Um, 
in the European case, it famously uh, instituted a, uh, a trade case against um, European wine, knowing that the relevant European commissioner owned a vineyard. So it can be very, very precise in its uh, forms of retaliation. And again, this is something, that, this is a game that we simply can't play uh, in kind. Um, quickly on that, I, I guess I should state from the outset that what I said does not, in, it, doesn't, it basically doesn't apply to Greece. Uh, that's number one. Uh, so don't expect uh, uh, any of this to mean that Greece is going to get, uh, or there's going to be any rush to uh, do debt sustainability and uh, negotiations and things like that. No, but the reason uh, uh, I think, uh, as you rightly pointed out, I mean, my argument is basically that for domestic political reasons, uh, uh, they're going to be more expansionary. Uh, but if you look at the logic of what happened in the case of Spain and uh, Portugal, basically the process is such that the lobbying, including by Wolfgang Schäuble, that took place uh, was basically for the commission to not recommend the fines. Uh, because if the commission had done that, uh, then it would have been the council, meaning the finance ministers, who would, uh, it would have to approve it. So they would be left holding the bag, sanctioning uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, in this case, Spain and Portugal, uh, for it. And uh, for Germany, quite clearly, but also others, they weren't willing to take that. Uh, I mean, they, it, would, it would be, first of all, fairly hypocritical uh, to do it, uh, uh, while they themselves are engaged in uh, a more accommodative or about to engage in a more accommodative fiscal policy. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, secondly, there are also uh, sort of narrower political interests involved here. Part of the reason why uh, was clearly that Wolfgang Schäuble wanted to help Mariano Rajoy. Uh, uh, so he wanted to avoid to have France, Spain, and Italy being run by uh, the center-left at the same time. Uh, and Portugal basically sort of got a freebie. Uh, uh, on that, knowing that the real constraint on Portugal is obviously uh, our Canadian uh, credit rating agency friends uh, uh, and the ECB. Um, but fundamentally, uh, uh, I guess I would say that that's fairly detailed, but bottom line is that these domestic reasons for doing it, uh, and more fiscal stimulus, uh, um, trumps the uh, uh, previous uh, desire to uh, a more rigid interpretation of the Stability and Growth Pact. It's really that simple uh, uh, in the end. Go to the final two questions, middle table here, and then back Mike second. Marcel Estevan from the IMF. Just a quick question to Dave uh, related to what Joe was saying. Do you see risks to the core inflation forecast coming from the CPI system? I mean, if you look core CPI, it seems that there's a more clear trend there and not unheard of, but unusual gap between core CPI and core PC. So how do you see the risks to the inflation forecast? Does it mean core PC is going to go up or core CPI is going to go down? So I think that gap is unusually wide and I would expect the gap to narrow on both sides, but more uh, the CPI not staying as high as it is. And again, the Fed's preference for the PCE was better measure, more comprehensive measure on healthcare, less weight to rental. I still think those, those factors make that measure a better measure of the underlying pace of inflation. Back. Hi, um, my name is Yoko Matsukawa of GG Press, Japanese news agency. And uh, my question's um, for uh, U.S. monetary policy. So um, as we see, uh, inside the Fed seems to be divided. And there are many questions about uh, labor market price and whether the economy is a new normal, new normal or the economy is going to overheat. So I want, um, in, the, in your presentation, you expect December may be possible to the next rate hike. But I wonder whether the gap of these official can be narrower. And there, is, there are some, pe some official, they still say in November is a possible choice, but e you expect uh, December. So is it because we may not have enough data 
until the November or because of the election. And I wonder, many people say, because there's election, November is impossible, and whether it's you know, true or not. So I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb and tell you if it's November, they raise rates in November, I will shovel the walks and driveway here at the Peterson Institute for every snowstorm this coming winter. <laughs> um, it just isn't, it's not, it's not going to happen. Um, I do think, you're, you're right, there is a tension on the committee um, between those that really feel that the Fed is either on the curve or behind the curve, and those who feel that there is more room to run. What's a little unusual about the current situation, in my mind, is that we actually have a chair who is not actually at the center of the committee, but probably is more aligned with those sympathetic to the view that the pace of rate, increase, rate increases can be very gradual. And in fact, I think that's sort of the way she led the committee over the past year, when a year ago they were expecting four increases over the course of uh, 2016, and now maybe we'll get one. So um, I think, on that said, I do think um, in general, even those at the center to the center dovish side of the committee, do think that the process of normalization can proceed even if it proceeds slowly, that staying simply at zero and waiting entirely to see inflation definitively pick up is probably a risky strategy. There are some members who actually believe that to be the case, but I don't think that's even where the bulk of the center is at this point. So I think they're on track for raising rates. Now, raising rates just twice in 2017 Heck, that's not very much, given that they've, they were only done two thus far. So I think they'll still see that as a, a relatively gradual pace. Um, thank you all for uh, being here this afternoon. Your stamina and patience uh, is greatly appreciated.